Hey, everybody, how are you doing? Um, someone I've really looked forward to getting on the show um, who's almost created a cult-like uh, following with his core thesis is Brent Johnson, and I've got him on the other side uh, of this call. And he is, of course, the gentleman is an asset manager, first of all, let's say that, at Santiago Capital. Um, and he is, in essence, looking to manifest uh, alpha for his investors through his core thesis being the dollar milkshake theory. Uh, Brent, thank you for checking in with us. I'm really glad to have you on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to you. Fabulous. Well, let's dive straight into it. I've also put up a share screen for our viewers. Um, that's the dollar index. I might start actually on a slightly bigger time frame uh, because I'm sure, like everybody, there's a lot of Monday morning quarterbacks. And when you have an overarching theory that is talking about the dollar actually gaining weight uh, and uh, pushing up, and I don't think in any way your theory has been diminished by recent price actions, but people being who they are and Twitter, I think, as you said, being exactly what it is. Um, they're very quickly to hold your toes to the fire yeah. on just current short-term price behavior. So how are you surviving that, first of all? Let's let you loosen up on that one. Yeah, yeah. well, first of all, um, I would say to anybody that likes to give me a hard time on Twitter, you know, send me your best shot because, it, you know, I, I really don't care. <laughs> right. um, so you know, I... Yeah, yeah. I mean, you got to have thick skin in this business. And listen, we, we all get things right. We all get things wrong. Um, you know, I wouldn't still be doing this after 20 years if I was getting it wrong more than I got it right. So, you know, I, I have no problem saying I'm wrong. I have no problem saying I got it wrong, but I'm still here and I'm still fighting. And, you know, I, I don't plan to go anywhere. So uh, I actually enjoy the back and forth. I enjoy the banter. I enjoy being challenged. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm here to you know help my, my friends, my family and my clients. And if somebody else doesn't like what I'm doing, well, you know, that's fine. Exactly. You know, absolutely the right uh, response. I have to say, uh, just in this, a kind of similar analogy, I did a grand macro gold analysis that actually took shadow stats and actually worked out what the gold price really is if we deflated it according to what the 82 Reganomics uh, inflation rate, which is John Williams' shadow stats, uh, and largely said, you know, the gold and silver market really haven't even got started if you look at it in that right. context. And I released that uh, video. It took a lot of number crunching on Excel, literally the day before the gold and silver pullback uh, occurred. And so I got a bit of the yay boo boys out uh, on me as well. So uh, I think it's an occupational yeah. hazard uh, in terms of uh, trying to be forward looking and being a futurist. Let's get straight into uh, the meat of it, I suppose, in essence. If I were to synopsize, how would you embellish this further? The dollar, the dollar. Uh, a milkshake theory is in essence the fact that there is the big crux being lots of offshore requirements for dollars, many of it in debt-based instruments that obviously require coupon payments. And many of these lender nations are not uh, selling enough goods, obviously, to Americans. And as a result, there could be defaults. Defaults then roll into collapsing almost a black hole of money that suddenly sees a shortage of dollars exist in the event of rolling systemic debt crisis. If, if you look at that little summary, how would you want to add to that and addend a little further? Well, I, th I, th I think you kind of hit the nail right on the head. You want to, you, if, if you want a job, feel free to move to San Francisco and you, you can do mine for me. But uh, no, I, th I, th I think that's largely correct. And, and I, think, I think where people have trouble with my theory is that they say, well, they'll just stop using the dollar. They'll go to gold or they'll go to silver or they'll go to Euro. And my, my point to them is that, you know, and, and my point to them is if they wanted to do that, they already would have. But, you know, governments are not like people. Governments do not want a gold standard. Um, they're not going to go to gold until they absolutely have no other choice. So the idea that they're just tomorrow going to redominate, redenominate all these contracts, all these invoices and all these debt based instruments in gold or silver or copper or euros or yen or whatever. It's just I think it is a very, very low probability event. And, and until a new system comes along and a new system is designed and a new system is accepted and a new simple system is implemented and they do this all while the US Navy is shooting you know, Tomahawk missiles over their heads, I don't see another system, right? This is the system. And you know, 
Someday it will change. I just don't think we're there yet. It's basically a timing issue with me versus a lot of the, the people who disagree with me. Is, you know, the dollar is uh, on borrowed time. Um, it, it's, it's, its status as a reserve currency will end. I just don't think it's going to end as soon as everybody else. And I don't think it's going to die of weakness. I think it's going to die of strength. So I don't know. It's a little bit of a rambling answer, but I hope that helps kind of explain it. No, I like that. Uh, and it's quite interesting. It's also that it appeals to my contra intuitive um, understanding of how things really do exactly what you expect them to do. They actually often do the corollary. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if we were to refer to someone, uh, a character, and I, I won't get into uh, drama, but say, for example, Peter Schiff saying dollar goes to zero. I always ask the question against what other fiat right. with a similar problem, only less required internationally. Uh, for which the system is not more reliant on. The dollar, in essence, is the foundation of a rickety house. And until the, we sign yeah. off that the rickety house needs demolishing, you can't pull that foundation out. All the other currencies are actually built on top of that. And um, when you talk about something based on uh, going to zero, like the dollar, it can only be going to zero then in some new, as yet undisclosed future financial system. I, I did some postulating. I'm just curious how you're thinking. Um, if they tried to before, whether we went full blown, you know, Fed coin, crypto coin, and did this transition to new world money, um, as many uh, think we may well do, if, is it possible? You know, the Woku, the SDRs, essentially they're basically just based on the same toxic nations that are hopelessly indebted. Do you think they might try no. turn the whole, call it a Ponzi scheme for for, for slang sense? into a basket, because I saw this very much with subprime. Um, amazingly, you took bad in debt instruments, you create a portfolio of it, you kind of striate it according to quality yeah. slice and dice it, and alchemy occurs. You, you, you know, you put crap in there, but you get gold out um, yeah. when you do that. So maybe the portfolioizing of a multitude of currencies, you know, a little bit of yen, they'll include the Chinese, it'll be a little bit of ego stroking, but the dollar will still be the preeminent one to please the gold bugs. Maybe we get a percentage allocation of gold that maybe later gets whittled away, but it's kind of like a foot in the door uh, of something non-fiat. And they create this basket uh, for a while while we're waiting it. What, what, do you, what do you think that is a possibility in terms of yeah, I, I, world health? I think that's a real possibility. Again, I think that I think what's going to happen is at some point over the next two to three years, the dollar is going to get so strong that they're going to have to do either some kind of a reset or a new introduction of a new currency or a, a new understanding or a new global agreement. And it, it, to me, it would be very possible to do some kind of a basket of currencies or a basket of commodities or currencies plus commodities, some kind of a globally diversified uh, thing that everybody can agree on. Um, but, you know, I don't I don't think but when, when that happens, I, the U.S., I think, is still going to have a say in how that happens. And, you know, the, the other powers of the world are going to have a say in how that happens. And again, governments, I believe, do not want to go back to a gold standard. Now, they yeah. may be forced. They may be forced to include it in some way or another to get the market to buy into it. But I just don't think that they're going to willingly do that. So so I my, my whole theory is that the dollar gets very strong over the next couple of years and then crashes as a new system, whatever that is, is rolled out. Now, I wish I had a crystal ball that told me exactly what that new system was gonna be. Um, but you know, I think the one that you've proposed is extremely plausible. I agree with you. We can't, uh, for force of necessity in the way that the money system is run, Gold instills far too much discipline on governments who won't want that. And proliferation is not easily done, which is what we kind of saw that movie with uh, Nixon in the Vietnam era 71 yeah. um, and even in instances before that. So um, it's uh, it's too it's too much of a straitjacket for them to do. So I, I also like you, I set it aside. Uh, turkeys aren't going to vote for Christmas uh, in terms of having all their, their powers of being able to pander to um, special interest groups, proliferate, you know, military industrial complex, etc. But uh, it is, it, it is, it, it, it's even possible that the dollar doesn't do the crash, but the melt up is the crash because everything is yeah. relative. When people say something crashes, it's crashing against what? I, I, yeah. I have a sort of a dominoes in, in almost my own invade theory of currencies where the weaklings are outside the city walls. 
and these are the currencies, yeah. and they're the smaller dominoes. So we'll have the Turkish lira. Um, I'm a South African. I'm afraid to say the rand is going to be pretty close to there. Might not yeah. make it inside the walls. And then the bigger defenses as you go deeper into the core, and actually the, do the dollar is that biggest domino yeah. in the middle and instead of having lines of dominoes you actually have a circle of dominoes and it's, it collapses in from the periphery towards that's right uh, the middle and with each collapsing it that elevates the ones in the middle because that same flow that used to exist has to run somewhere new and so actually you get us you get the spiking that's in the middle yeah. that's my visual manifestation of probably your theory and when you talk about the dollar milkshake theory shouldn't we then be looking at um, as traders and investors, the fact that for the dollar to win that well, we start with the FX emerging's failure from the periphery, yeah. which we've already seen quite a bit thereof. How do you feel about that as, as from a trading perspective and how that goes yeah. down? Because it's a relative, FX is always pairs and it's against what? Yeah, so, the, you know, again, you've, you've, you, you, you have a probably as good of understanding of my theory as anybody I've talked to so far, because the, the point I always try to make is that I actually believe that dollars and gold are going to rise together against everything else. And so I've said, we're going to get into a period where they rise together. And many people say that's impossible. They can't, they're, they're the inverse of each other. They can't rise together. Well, if you only look at the world as two assets, then you're correct. They can't rise together versus each other, but they can rise together versus everything else. And I'm a firm believer that everybody should have gold in their portfolio. Okay, so let's take care of the gold allocation. I don't care whether the allocation is 1% or 99%. If you don't want to put 100%, I don't want to put 100% of my portfolio in gold. Um, and I don't think anybody else should put 100% of their portfolio in gold. But if, you know, if, if you're going to put 100% of your portfolio in gold, then do it and just go away and just wait because you have nothing else to do. But if you don't yeah. want to put 100% of your portfolio in gold, let's pretend, let's pretend you have a heavy weighting that's 25 or 30%. Okay, that still leaves 70% of your portfolio where you need to go somewhere else. So, you know, we've got our 30 percent in gold. You put it away. We can't even talk about gold anymore. It's no longer part of the conversation because we, we got it and it's taken care of. Now yes. we've got now. Now we now we are in the with the with the remaining 70 percent. We are in the land of fiat. And let's say you line up 10 fiat currencies. One of those fiat currencies is going to outperform the other nine fiat currencies. This is just math. It's yeah. just the way it works. You don't have to like it, but that's the way it works. And if you can yeah. figure out which of those one fiat currency is going to outperform the other nine. And many people think that you're wrong on the one that you think it's going to go higher. You can make a lot of money with the other 70% of your portfolio. Now gold might go to $10,000 in the meantime, and that's fine. And that's good because we've already got that allocation, but you can yes. also make money. You can also make money and make profit on the other part of the portfolio. That's not in gold. And that's Great. the essence of my argument. Um, to your point, this is going to start on the periphery and work its way in. Uh, the idea that the U.S. dollar, which is the center of the financial universe, other than gold, is going to be the first one to collapse and all these others are going to rise as it, as it smolders in the ashes, I just think is completely absurd. Now, I know there's a lot of people who disagree with me and that's fine. It's, it's always good to have disagreements and challenge thinking, but I just can't see that happening based on the design of the system. And, you know, and so I, I am more than happy to bet that the dollar remains stronger longer than most people think it will. Yes. Uh, you know, it's a very, it's a very popular meme right now that the U S dollar is going to lose its reserve currency status. It can't survive as currently designed. Da, 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 da. Well, I, I just like to point out that, you know, four months ago, people were worried about the, the dollar's, is standing in the world reserve currency because it was too strong and it was at 102. You know, three or four months later, it's it's down 10 percent and it's at 93, and now it's too weak to survive as the world reserve currency. So that's a pretty that's a pretty narrow band for something yeah. that's been the world reserve currency for 80 years yeah. Um, yeah. and has the the biggest consumer market, the deepest capital market, and the biggest military. Exactly. So you know, if you want to bet if, in there. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of superiority to complex to inferiority to complex yeah. in, a, in a nanosecond. <laughs> sure, sure. And I guess that, that's my point is probabilities, right? Now, is it possible that the U.S. collapses first? Yeah, it's possible. I can't completely rule it out. So therefore, you have your gold, da, 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 but you don't want to bet 100% of your portfolio on the U.S. being the first to collapse. I just think that that's silly. So that, that's so it's a, it's a relative game. When you're allocating capital, it's a relative game.
and and the the key element for me also is unfortunately in games when you talk about currency it's not about the purity of which one's less indebted because the dollar is very highly indebted and yeah. probably yeah. the state or the degree it is if you listen to some boston professors but unfortunately might is right in these situations and yeah. scale and degree of usage is going to uh, proliferate uh, and, do and dominate um, because it's utility it's utility yeah. it's recognizability it's actually brand um people know it you know mcdonald's yeah. is a brand it isn't necessarily yeah. the best meal but everybody knows what they're getting and other people will accept it uh, and i think a dollar actually holds that and the fact that people hold it as it's it's almost won the game of scale um and yeah. that's amazon it, it, it may yeah. not be profitable like amazon but it's scaled like amazon if i have to take a chance and i want to do something online and retail and i want to feel confident it's going to get delivered um, unfortunately, many people will, you know, go to the biggest guy in the room, and it won't necessarily yeah. be the cheapest. Won't necessarily be uh, everything. Yeah. So that's 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 really intriguing for me, and I agree with you that I, I think it will be the last. And I actually think, as I say, it will be this melt-up spike. Yeah. And I also agree that they will simultaneously go. People, the the binary, the seesaw element, where which everyone applies to gold, is actually incorrect. I think that's the euro and the USD. Of course, when you're looking yeah. at the dollar index yeah. chart, which we have, it already has a lot of euro in it. So we're kind of yeah. looking at the upside down euro, USD anyway. But in essence, they're the two biggest, although the euro lacks the penetration and the debt uh, and the note prevalence that the dollar has. So it's not really a fair contest. But when the dollar is weak and people want another fiat, then there is a bit of movement into the euro, as yeah. we saw recently. Um, gold is almost a different level of money. We're talking about currency and fiat and faith. Yeah. While people are still accepting yeah. paper, those two are rivals. It, it's like you can't compare American football linebacker to, um, you know, a goalkeeper in a soccer club. The, the, the gold is almost a different yeah. category. We've, yeah. we've gone and set out an anti-fiat category, which we've kind of included. And we actually get correlations out of um, Bitcoin, uh, silver, gold uh, as a category generally when we're seeing when there's fear about fiat generally. And we're saying there's this bigger macro group and we are seeing uh, relevance and we're actually using some of them at timing and there's even delays uh, in the, but yeah. usually there's some uh, reaction um, in the cryptos. And as you say, I, I think they will both go up because everything yeah. will be fleeing everything else. Right. And there'll be those right. that will flee to the corner of the fiat room where the biggest yeah. guy is. And there'll be some that run out of the room and go into the gold vault in the basement. Yeah. And then yeah. you'll see them both going up uh, in, uh, in a similar a similar essence. Um, let's have, just have a look at the charts maybe for a little bit, just yeah, to sure. change of pace. Yeah, uh, I hope you can see that well. I've got a yep. little uh, draw pen that I was going to do. Funny enough, yep. we did a scenario um, for a continuation pattern here, which would imply an upside breakout, which is still actually... Uh, a valid call. So I'm not one of those people that actually think you've gone off mark. I just think it's the natural ebb and flow of markets that you get yeah. uh, pushbacks. We kind of uh, have uh, continuation patterns uh, like that that we see often yep. occurring in the currency markets. And in fact, this was the first of a new trend. If I just very bluntly draw yep. two uh, triangles for you and not get too uber technical. And of course, we had overperformance. We draw targets as well out of that. And we saw this yep. target perfectly perfectly made at that point. Then you went into a bit of congestion, a little blow off more, and you had your first meaningful pullback. Um, yep. And then subsequently, our scenario, um, which, as I say, we feel aligns very closely to you, we kind of expected a doming out. This was our scenario and a little bit of a pullback. We called for a 91 and a half to 93 box. Yep. We saw it happening somewhere over here. Yeah, and yeah. we were where we were call it inaccurate, we were expecting an easing. Um, yep. This was a little bit uh, brutal in terms yep. of the degree that it came down. But I think the key thing many people forget is that in three months, I think it's around five trillion was pro proliferated. Yeah. So it can yeah. get brutal. It, it's yeah. not invalidating. It's actually no, it, that five yeah. trillion, uh, sorry, I'll hand the talking stick straight back. That yeah. five trillion is part of the future uh, squeeze up when it needs to yes. come back because it wasn't donations, it was loan. <laughs> exactly. So, so what's your take you know, I, yeah, it's, I agree with you a hundred percent. And so the first thing I would say is that, that my theory is not based on technicals. It's based on fundamentals. Um, and, and I can tell you what those are, but of course I do look at technicals as well. 
And I think the charts that you've drawn here are absolutely correct. I've drawn those myself. I've also drawn one if you go back, you know, from the 2011 low and just take one long line, you know, up from the bottom to the right, you know, we're kind of right on that 10 year support line right now. Um, and then not only that, but, you know, we, we're sitting kind of right on that 10 year support line, but we have also got um, the lowest sentiment reading uh, since 2011. We've got the biggest, you know, long position in the euro and the biggest short position in the dollar since 2011. Um, all we which have has all which has to unwind at some point. We just had uh, on Friday both a DMARC countdown and a DMARC setup signal that both triggered on the same day, which it's really rare for them to trigger even close to each other, let alone on the same day. And and to your point, nothing has fundamentally changed other than price. The way they've fixed the problem is that they've delayed the problem, but in delaying the problem, they've made the problem bigger. So nothing. So in my opinion, is nothing has changed. Now, yeah. is it possible that that ten-year support line breaks and we fall into the eighties? Of course, it's possible. Any it, listen in capital markets, anything is possible. I won't rule anything out. But to think that the dollar, everything is now fixed, even though nothing has been changed, I think is just wrong. And so based on the design of the system itself, until the system is changed, the prospect of a spiking dollar remains. Yeah. And if that dollar spikes, it has enormous implications for the rest of the world. And Absolutely. I would argue and I would argue that the fiat game, again, if we take gold out of the equation and we just talk about fiat, the fiat game is rigged in favor of the global reserve currency. Uh, and I can go through all the reasons why that is. But now, could, could they really you know, do something crazy and push it down into the mid 80s? Sure. Uh, if they spend all the money that's sitting in the, the Treasury's general account in the next two months, then, the, then you know, the dollar will go to the mid 80s. Uh, but that doesn't fix anything. And, and the prospect for a spiking dollar still exists. Um, so uh, I like the charts that you've drawn here. I, I've used several of them myself. And, uh, you know, like I said, the underlying thing is that nothing has been changed. It's kind of like the when they had the big uh, tsunami in Thailand 10 years ago or whatever that was. Initially, the wave washed out and everybody said, oh, there it goes. That's the dollar. It's washing out. But and the, they the wrecking they, they and, they chased, the and they chased <laughs> it. Right. But the, re the wrecking ball is when it comes roaring back in. And that's what, you know, maybe they can push the dollar into the 80s. I don't know. But that wrecking ball is going to come roaring back in. And when it does. If you if you if you remember back in March, on March 9th, the dollar index was around 94 and it, it had fallen three or four percent in, in the space of a week. And everybody was saying, oh, there it goes. There it goes. The dollar's going to zero. Nine yeah. days later, nine days later, it was at 102. Yeah. So the point yeah. is, is when when these when, when these when these spikes come, they come very fast and very hard. And if you're not ready for it, um, you know, that's that's volatility. And my point is the other point that I like to make mm. is that what's happened in the last three months, that is the central banks willing winning. That's the central banks getting what they want. Now, if you think the central banks are going to fail, you don't bet on the dollar going lower. Yeah. <laughs> the, the dollar going lower is the central banks winning. Yeah. The, when the dollar goes higher, that is the central banks losing. And I think the I think the faith in central banks is overplayed. I don't think that they have as much control as everybody likes to think. And I think it will get away from them. And when it gets away from them, I think the dollar will go higher, not lower. Let, th this is fascinating. And I agree with so much uh, of what you said, as I say, we're in some sense, kindred spirits. Um, I think there's very few things that I, I've differed on um, with you, and I'll raise them because it's going to make interesting discussion, and I may even reconsider yeah. if you make a, a strong case, which you're likely to. But we'll get to those uh, later. I'll just show you something that's really interesting on a technical comment. Often when you top, you get a final blow-off. Yeah. And in all this topping period, we had a final blow-off. We then got uh, on a smaller time frame, just a couple of interesting technical points for you. This uh, first in a downtrend yep. because what recursed was that, and that was actually something we were observing. And yeah. We were a bit reluctant because we were a bit biased bull, but we also had the feeling we needed this down leg. We thought, well, it's unlikely to be so strong because we capped out. And it actually was the best trade we never took, actually shorting the dollar for a while. But we kind yep. of have fundamental bias at the, t at the time, so we didn't, we didn't take it. 
uh, and I kind of regret it because it actually was high, even higher yeah. momentum than we expected. It made all targets and overperformed. Um, but in the same way that it does that near the top, um, that will be uh, so when we have this fi these kind of sell-offs uh, near the low, final capitulation lows and mates, yeah. you get almost a natural geometry. And you, as you mentioned, too many positions very strongly uh, euro long. Um, yeah. And we've got brutal setups on the IBEX index, which I don't want to get into too many other asset categories because it's mainly about fiats, um, but really high quality, high probability structures that we rate highly. And we've made some outrageous calls um, which have come out. Uh, as a result of good quality structures. So the Eurozone is going to face some degree of real pain because Spain is, it, all their IBEX right. is financial, yeah. real yeah. estate, construction, and yep. tourism. And we're in yeah. COVID-19 and they've not done very well on their COVID. So, yeah. uh, and that's a 50%. And well, then the think, about, th think about how many European banks have exposure to Turkey. From yeah. the banks from Spain and Italy and, and Greece. I mean, th listen, I mean, that's, to your point, the, the, the periphery working towards the center. You know, the euro is, is one of the currencies inside the walls. But the problem is, is that they've lent, they've lent money to these, you know, currencies that are outside the walls. And when, Tur when Turkey gets in trouble, the euro is not going to be immune to that. So, you know, I, th I think the faith that everybody has put in the euro recently is, is, is overdone. Very misguided, very misguided. And it's funny how you're already finishing my sentences and you're bringing the next topics because before mentioning the IBEX, the, next, the first thing I wanted to do was stay within fiats and I wanted to go to the lira. Many people don't realize 19th <laughs> yeah. biggest global economy, yeah. Yeah. highest dollar-based debt per GDP of any current yeah. nation. And we noticed because we watched the charts. I love the fundamentals. That's why we can connect there. But I always like to see what's happening on the charts and we're technically aware. And this to me seemed after all these swap lines went out and the liquidity was being provided like an attempt at a soft peg at 6.85. I don't know if you can spot yeah. this area. I'll just square it in my favorite color, transgender pink there. Um, but there was almost a, yeah. soft, a soft peg at attempt yeah. at the 6.8. And I've seen these a number of times attempted by the yeah. Turkish Central Bank. And very soon, even while the dollar was losing ground against the euro, this yeah. started its break, return move. Let me get rid of the squares, sorry. Get the yeah. lines back. The, the break and return move. And then uh, exactly what you see here against yeah. uh, the Turkish lira. Right. And I kind right. of feel... Forgive me for having a slight conspiratorial element to my makeup, but I kind of feel the globe and all these transnational organizations are not yet ready to allow the domino event of the FX emergings all to fail. And in yeah. spite of that desire, you've got the weakest one here that can't buy a bid even yeah. once that liquidity has been provided. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And this is how no, I'm that's seeing right. it. Uh, and I think... I, I th th I think what one thing for, again for your for your listeners who may not be aware, the way that that pink box is done is Turkey has used the so Turkey needs a lot of dollars because you know their their, their economy, despite them being you know having the Turkish lira as their base currency, their economy depends on dollars to run, and they have a large amount of external dollar debt, and a lot of their trade is done in dollars. So they need, what, regardless of whether they like dollars or hate dollars, they need dollars to operate. And the way that that pink box, the way that pink box was established, that quasi-peg, was they spent the dollars that they had to maintain that stability, right? And the fact that they had to spend that many dollars, they had to spend a large amount of dollars to maintain that peg when the dollar was already falling, shows you how weak the Turkish lira actually is. And That's now that they're running, now, now that they're getting kind of down to the, I think they have 40, $50 billion in reserves, but that's falling quickly. And you know, you can see once it starts to get to the end, look how quickly it starts to rise. And that's my point with all of this stuff. You know, people, you know, go, kind of goes back to your Twitter comment, you know, th something trends for two or three days or two or three months and everybody's like, oh, it's over. That's it. Well, yeah. things can reverse and go the other way very quickly. Right. I mean, you had this all this stability, you know, you know, for the month of June in the Turkish lira, and it looked like, oh, Turkey's got everything under control. And then two weeks later, boom, it's at the highest level ever. Yeah. And it shows uh, to me, pegs generally always fail. And it's the biggest. They always fail. Anytime yeah. a 
government wants to hold the line. So we, you, you won't know this about our history, but we called the original crash of the Euro Swiss franc in 09. And we mm -hmm. saw that, that there was already SNB um, interaction in the market and we got our pattern structure. And you, you actually had the Euro Swiss franc fall from 1.5. And then in a the second stage, they established a peg at 120 and it actually fell to ones and actually yeah. bankrupted a number of retail brokers. Uh, yeah. And just in the UK alone, there was about 500 billion uh, 500 million lost just in yeah. these retail brokers. Some of them had yeah. to get recapitalized. FXCM, Alpari just about died entirely, all on the basis of the single trade because everyone thought yeah. they had a free trade with a with a wall at their back yeah. where they could just buy at the thing and run and uh, that there was no risk. And when it's a central bank, uh, funny enough, in that particular event, and I'm expecting a similar scenario politically. This is why I want to listen as well as watch charts and also understand the fundamentals because you get the early clues. The central banks uh, actually were forced into a statement before they walked. And we then went, forget it. It's not Q1 of 2015. It'll be January. In November, the head of the Swiss National Bank said it's absolutely yeah. central to our policy, which means it was he was under pressure to make a statement about it. Right. So straight right. away, I didn't listen to the content of what he said. I realized that people are now coming down on him hard. And as soon as they heard Draghi was going to do whatever it takes, which they would have known before us, they yeah. walked. Uh, and yeah. that prediction actually came about. They don't always, but that one came about. And then you had a 30% yeah. in two major currencies. And I'm yeah. expecting, and I mention it because I think there's going to be amazing narratives yeah. like this. Everybody yeah. loves the story. There's going to be some incredible stories politically involving Absolutely. central bankers as this in, involves. But the end fundamental yeah. result is very much like the gold and uh, dollar super spike in the middle as the periphery collapses down. Uh, it's yeah. absolutely fascinating. So in a sense, um, Brent, you talk a lot about the dollar milkshake theory, and it's a lot about the dollar. But if the gold is going up against that dollar, mm -hmm. shouldn't you be quite heavily overweight? I mean, I am chronically overweight. I would say normal portfolio management theory yeah. wouldn't consider that advisable. Um, but th that is for normal times. I actually yeah. reframe. You, you, you know, I wear, if I was came to this interview wearing my motorcycle helmet and pads and kit, it would be a bit <laughs> OTT. But when I'm riding the bike, you actually yeah. wear all the clobber. And I'm saying yeah, yeah. this is it's time to wear all the clobber. It's going to get bumpy out there. And actually, the insurance trade is probably the biggest trade. In some senses, why didn't you have the gold milkshake theory as well? And given that you expect the movement of the gold, isn't the gold the real trade? Because it's been precious. When you say gold, I'm assuming yeah. bullion. I'm a huge silver bull because of the ratio. Yeah. And I'm expecting yeah. an overshoot to the downside. So we actually rotated out of gold into silver when we saw the extremity of a 128 turning and it gave yeah. a technical there at about 113. Yeah. But why haven't you incorporated a bit more of that? Or is it you have, you're just not talking about it? It's less of a narrative. Well, you know, I, I actually used to run a gold fund. And I'm, I am, I, you know, if you go back to the, some of the work in the presentation, I started putting presentations out there and speaking at conferences and doing interviews back in 2010, 2011 on gold, um, because I'm a huge believer in gold. I, I don't know now, I, I mean, there's a lot of people who talk about gold, but I have talked a lot about gold and why you should have gold. And, you know, I, I actually ran a gold fund for a while. And, you know, unfortunately, it was during the, the, the bear market run and we just couldn't raise enough assets to make it viable. It doesn't mean that I when, when I shut it down, it doesn't mean that I had given up on gold. I just couldn't justify running it in that vehicle because that vehicle was a very expensive way to own gold. Um, but uh, but it didn't. So I have, you know, if the very first presentation that I put out where I started making the case to own dollars as well as gold was in the summer of 2016, four years ago. And the very end of that presentation ends with a slide saying that gold will win the final battle. Yeah. That even though the dollar is going to go higher, gold will win the final battle. And I think I've said that in every presentation and every interview that I've put out since then. Yeah. Now, the reason I probably don't hit it as hard as I used to is because I think there are plenty of people out there talking about gold. Okay. I don't think that there's I don't think there's there's that many people talking about the dollar in the way that I am and understand the implications of it the way I try to lay it out. And again, part of the you know I think a lot of people get this wrong uh, regarding my views of the dollar. I actually don't like the dollar. I, I think it's a horrible currency. 
I think that uh, the U.S. has many sins to pay for and that we are, you know, we're going to have to pay the piper at, at some point as well. And I think in, in some kind of a moral and just world, we would be the first to pay the piper. I just don't think that's how it's going to happen. So there's a difference between what you want to have happen and what you think is actually going to have happen. And I think that even though people may hate the dollar and maybe they don't want the dollar, I think they're going to have to buy it. And so, and, and the other thing is that people will ask, well, you know, let's say the dollar goes from 95 to 115 or 120. That's only 20%. I mean, you can make 20% in a gold miner in the two or three days. You know, yep. that's not that big of a, that's not that big of a move. And my point is, is that when I talk about dollars and gold, buy and when I talk about buying dollars, it's not just buying and owning the currency. It's it's playing the knock on effects of the dollar going from 95 to 120. If the dollar goes from 95 to 120, the knock on effects around on the global markets are going to be astronomical. And because not many people think it's going to happen, you can make some very asymmetric bets that if it does, will pay off in an enormous way, very asymmetrical way. And so my point is that even if even if you disagree with me, take a small percent of your portfolio, two, three, five, six percent, allocate it to some of these trades. If I'm wrong, you're going to be just fine yeah. because the other 95 percent of your portfolio is going to make up for it. But if I'm right, if I'm right, if I'm even a little bit right, that 5% can become a huge part of the overall portfolio. And so I think that's kind of why, you know, I feel like I've said enough about gold. I think gold is the is the is, is going to win in the end. I think absolutely everybody should own gold. Um, but I think you need to own dollars as well. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And actually, while gold is doing what it's doing, uh, many people have liquidity requirements and you need it to sit in something yeah. and it's cap and it's quite feasible for you to have bank accounts in multiple jurisdictions, many of them offering right. dollars. So it's quite useful practically. And I'd argue yeah. as someone who asset manage, you probably also get, you mentioned the percentage move isn't that huge. You probably get huge leverage. FX markets, we can yeah. get great yeah. gathering for your returns yeah. as well. Sure. Um, that's against physical gold is very hard to uh, yeah. replicate. So in terms of attaining alpha, I'm like you. I'm beyond accepting that gold wins that. That's an old argument yeah. that should be won yeah. by most logical people. I'm interested in this collapse, the firing order, because I intend yeah. to jump on each of the stepping stones yeah. while they're still up and get jump off them as they sink. Yeah. And so yeah. it's, the, it's, it's, it's what manner does this go down? Yeah. Who's the last man standing? Because even if dollar crashes to next to zero, if I can trade it, with high leverage, uh, which I have the facility yeah. to do against the lira, and then roll that into the rand, and roll that into um, with big, big size compounding each time until eventually yeah. I'm playing even the, the slightly hard co commodity currencies. We're going through them all, including the Aussie and the CAD, and uh, we start climbing the tree. Yeah, um, you don't even have to be in the gold trade. You should have retired out, and what you potentially could have made in that yeah. series. But it won't all be. Um, simultaneous all fall down simultaneously the weaklings fall first yeah. sort of zone yeah. four zone three zone two zone one dollar in the middle the that's, king that, that's exactly that's exactly how we see it playing out so you know we, we you know we buy gold we put it away you don't even you know in some ways gold is very easy because you just buy it and you, and you can literally just forget about it that's your insurance policy right. right and then you can focus on these other progressions and i think the ability to make some astronomical profits by jumping these, you know, different, uh, you know, from the out, from the outskirts to to to, to the to the inner city, I, I think I think the I think the opportunities are tremendous. And like I said, you don't have to get them all right. You don't have to get it perfect. But if you even get a couple of them right, you can make some very significant profits. We we are also getting a little bit of stick given the the delay on a macro call that we really really like immensely, which is an Asian play. I'm pulling up the Korean one um, mm -hmm. here, Brent, and we've actually got a major. This is why we're seeing technically a lot of support for the dollar milkshake theory, and I always like to see that in the DNA of the footprint in terms of yeah. a rather unique way of looking at the technicals. If you look at that, this was the precursor. With very yeah. low volatility, I'll do it in blue this time, um, if for the 96, 97 Asian crisis, um, yeah. right here, your little low volatility spell in 96 that could have got you into the trade, early, mid-96 that you could have run up the Korean one from the better part of 800s 
to a super spike that took you to 1880. Now you can right. only imagine what a delight <laughs> that kind of a yeah. emerging trade is in terms yeah. of haymaker. And the interesting part of the structure is that in essence, um, our thesis technically is that this is still winding up. And in fact, we got false started. The blow off spike in the dollar index that then was the final flurry before we yeah. had this sell off. This fall started us in, and I got in a similar way. That's why I feel a kindred spirit uh, towards you, in essence, is that we got, oh, well, what happened to your career in one big call trade? Because I've gone for a, in excess of 2,000. We're off the charts here in terms of yeah. what I expect to see. And that's going to be a very interesting socio dynamic because it involves China, the whole yeah. Southeast Asian complex. But it means the Asian version of the dollar milkshake trade. And what I'm kind yeah. of asking, okay, if I let the lira go first and then the rand and the, maybe the peso, at what point do we get to the moderately quality but still compromised currencies yeah. that you can still trade, like the Korean one? What order? When does he come? And we got faked in with that and we, we ate red as a result because it came back in. It's quite yeah. rare, but it does happen. You get a trip trade and you get sure. a return move. And that's kind of what this Dixie blow off and then uh, subsequent easing has done for us. Yeah. But actually, we're seeing 2000s uh, on this. And this is another what I call a potential haymaker yeah. trade. Do you have an Eastern yeah. take on the dollar? move? I'd love to yeah. hear your, your view. Well, no. So we, we, we so again, very similar. We think that this is going to be a progression. And when one currency, if you go back to your spike, what was that, 98 when that happened? That was um, the 98 Asian crisis, yeah, 97. That's right. To 98. Well, so I think I think I think what the point I would make here is if you go back and you we're looking at the Korean one right now, but go look at all the other currencies during that time too. They all had that spike because when it happens to when it happens to one currency, it bleeds over and it leads to contagion. And so you know the the idea that you know that this is so one it only happens to one country and it's no big deal is wrong because once one currency goes down it has implications for the next one and the next one and the next one and it becomes a domino effect and it doesn't mean and people and, and i think when that domino effect happens people will rush to the dollar not because they want to but because they have to and because it's the knee-jerk reaction of where they have to yes. go until the new system comes in and when you, when the dominoes start falling, you know, some of these countries like, you know, some people say Canada, Australia, Korea, they're, they're, they're strong economies. They're good. They're bigger. They're not these emerging markets. That's true. But when the emerging markets start start uh, falling, that has implications for the now the medium sized countries and those, they're going to go through the same problems. And then that's going to bleed up to, you know, the, the dollar and the euro and, so, and the yen. And those will eventually have problems too. But again, it's it's the if you have a hurricane that comes through, it's it's the weaker houses that fall first. It's not the it's not the houses in the center of the city that, that fall first. But that's why I think I'm so fascinated by it because it could be a cascading series yeah. of trades that yeah. is a career maker. Well, so then uh, to, to your point, and th 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 this is. Yeah, you will keep rolling into it. It's it's it's, yes. it's, it's you, you're trading the same thing. We we're trading the exact same thing, and this is why a lot of people will ask me like, "What's your time frame?" And I keep telling them it's two or three years. And this is two or three years. This can't go on for another two or three years. And I'm like, Jesus, it's gone on. The, the 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 global financial crisis was 12 years ago now. I mean, they've kept the plates spinning for 12 years. Why can't they keep it spinning for another two years? But not only that, but as as these periphery economies fall. I believe, uh, I can be wrong, but my belief is that the liquidity will get squeezed into the U.S. And as that liquidity comes into the U.S., it will give a, it's like a, it's like getting a pump, uh, an injection of heroin or, or, or adrenaline. And it, and yeah. it gives the, U, it, it provides the U.S. a little bit longer time period before it ultimately falls. And so because we're starving the rest of the world of that liquidity and we're taking liquidity, it actually gives us a little bit longer before we ultimately fall. And that's why I think this could play out over two or three years, not over the next two or three months. I mean, there's a lot of people that are saying, you know, the dollar is not even going to make it to the end of the year before it loses its global reserve status. And I, I, just, I think it's ridiculous. I mean, I, I know some of these people and I respect them and they, 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 they mean well and they're well intentioned. I, I just think they're wrong. And and I think this is going to take longer to play out than many people think. I think it'll be a couple. To take away yeah. from the fact that one nation state has the benefits of 
global currency. This is why I'm on the basket theory, because that'll sound like yeah. the democratization of money, that no one entity, even though dollar yeah. will still probably be one of the biggest weightings therein. But um, I think they need a crisis to do it. And they yeah. always work off a crisis. Yes, absolutely. The setup. absolutely. It's like you've got to put the golf ball on the tee. It's got to be perched yeah. there before you yeah. can swing and smack it uh, down the woods. There's one area absolutely. where I think I've, I kind of uh, stepped slightly aside from you and I have a, a difference of view. And I'd like to discuss that one because, A, I might learn something um, or B, maybe you'll uh, see something maybe you hadn't seen before. Uh, I've noticed technically because I watched the yen closely and I actually treat not only is the dollar a fear currency when there's pain and everyone rushes. We saw that in subprime crisis, a flood into the dollar. But in actual fact, in my view, technically, I continue to see the yen get a fear based bid when we have these outlier um, moments. And when you talk about the dollar current uh, milkshake theory, I think you see the dollar overarching over the, the yen. Um, yeah. What would be the case for the yen? They're both indebted nations, but the interesting thing that I, my understanding is that in the essence, it's a self-contained Ponzi in Japan because yeah. the, the, the citizens themselves are subsidizing their government and are the biggest holders of the JGBs. While America itself, in essence, not only relies on uh, very little support, maybe pension funds in the US, but actually relies on a lot of uh, international inbound uh, to hold up um, its end. Um, how, what's your take on the yen come the dollar milkshake? Because the yeah. one essence I've seen so far is there's always plunge protection, but we get real capitulation. These were points of fear. 19. Yeah. I think we had in uh, 16 when China had its wobble going in. 15 and 16, we came back really hard. These were all pressure points. This was the 18 crash on the equity side, and it gets bought back up. And technically, we tempted to uh, uh, say, look, this is a bit of a flat-bottomed uh, strata, and there's yeah. clearly some plunge protection at around the 104.5 level yep. who's doing that i don't know but every time we probe through it that we've been tempted to take a break because we actually have a target of 80s 80s for the dollar yen which could see the the yen actually nose ahead how and on what basis would you disagree yeah. with me what's your case so i think the where i would potentially disagree with you is one of timing but not necessarily potential levels so what well let me tell you what i mean by that is Essentially, my, my whole theory of the dollar milkshake theory is a short squeeze, right? Yeah. People have borrowed more dollars than are available, and when they have to scramble for those dollars, it's going to push the price up. Yeah. But the same thing exists. Uh, how do I explain this? The whole monetary system is designed this way. Money is yeah. loaned into existence with yeah. interest. So there is never enough money to pay off all the debt. So, and it, but, this, but this exists in all currencies. Correct. And so, and then there's also, even though there's the carry trade in the dollar, I say that people have shorted the dollar. There's never been a bigger short position in the history of the world. Well, there's also a carry trade in the yen. There's carry trades in the euro, but there's smaller carry trades. And so yeah. those, sometimes those smaller carry trades will get carried out and unwound before the big carry trade gets unwound. So it's yeah. very possible in some kind of a risk off event or some kind of a global you know, volatility, that the smaller yen carry trade gets unwound, yeah. and and the yen strengthens dramatically against the dollar. But it's but it's it, it's a cycle within a bigger cycle, and yeah. that cycle maybe plays out before the big U.S. dollar cycle. So but it would not shock. Part of yeah. what you say is that the yen could spike first and be an early yes. indicator. Yes. But yes. then the dollar dominance will then take back that and then yes. supersede it. And I'm yes. asking. Um, I, definitely yeah. the dollar, the amount out, lends out in the international world, that's a whole bigger scale game than the yeah. yen. But what in yeah. proportionality, the percentage portionality of proliferation for the yen in circulation, um, w for the unwinding of institutions that have uh, previously exploited the carry trade, which was the famous yeah. thing with the yen, because they've always had low interest rates long before we went to the next to zero interest rate policy. They're almost there before us. What if the proportionality of that, it's while small in scale, is actually a higher percentage? Because we could be talking about banks and institutions that have all done um, the carry trade and actually yeah. for the amount of in, that's in proliferation, it represents a higher percent, if not uh, nominally larger. 
I hear, I hear what you're saying. I, I guess I, I don't really have an answer for you. I, I got to think about it a little bit more. I don't want to just say something because I want to say something. I would need to think about it more. But um, I, I think a, the, 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 because the, the, the yen is a largely a homogenized or within Japan, it's not as used as much uh, as the dollar outside. And, and, you know, a lot of it is financed internally as opposed to externally. Um, you know, it can go on for a long time. As long as, but eventually, when when faith and confidence finally breaks, then then it, it's confidence, really, right? And once confidence in the yen goes, because they've printed so much or because of whatever they've done, then you then then the yen can start to lose value. And I don't know, and I think ultimately that will happen, but it that it might take a lot longer for that to happen to the yen than any of these peripheral currencies. And to your point, you could get a yen spike in the very short term. Um, you know, I, I can't rule that out. I will tell you that I think before it's all said and done, the yen's going to go to 150 or maybe even two. Okay, so you you will still think that uh, it's going to go because, uh, funny enough, the long term history of, we've not got enough data on this particular chart is one of yen appreciation uh, against. So in, at one yeah. point it was 680 yen to the pound, and it was about yeah. 230. I'm mean, talking about the 80s, and actually yeah. we get some data. These guys have been exporting, and in terms of quality, are we because it's a smaller audience group, but it might be a higher quality audience yeah. group. You're talking about Japanese pr people primarily losing confidence in their own yeah. currency, or yeah. a global scrambled egg big pot of yeah. right. global nations and their loss of confidence um, in the collective whole. And I just think it's not so clear cut uh, for me, and I'm not. Uh, and yeah. technically, it's not been supported by fear moments. Actually, the yen has gained a greater bit. That might just be uh, the first twitch of the rabbit out of the box, and then it gets caught and rained back. You may still be accurate. I'm open to persuasion, but um, yeah, no, I, I would, I would, I'd love to hear more. I'd love to hear more what you're thinking on that, and, and any information you have. Uh, like I, I'm, I'm always learning too. And there, you know, nobody's yeah. going to get this exactly right. Yeah, that's no, just fascinating because it could be a different, yeah. uh, it could they could bring a certain uh, twist and or element to this. And the other yeah. thing that's kind of uh, that the, the crypto and the precious metals guys would love us to bring back into the room is what if all of this is occurring and, and in a parallel sense, we've already started the early doors of Fed coin or um, yeah. tokenization of other things. Yeah. So there's actually a leak out of the the short squeeze because they the the new pony is being brought as the tired pony is is handling you yeah, know yeah. and there's a yeah, sort yeah. of parallel running and then Tonto uh, is jumping off the Lone Range is jumping off the one yeah. onto the other mid flight and that might take a little bit of the sting or the 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 scale of the burst because then there's a escape hatch that the early adopters, the crypto wise people take and all precious metal bulls, which leads to yeah. something that's already baked into your theory. The gold starts taking a lot on it. But then within yeah. that, we've got to remember that the crypto market, the total market cap is pretty damn small. So for yeah. absorbing high amount of currency, it'll, it, it'll might have liquidity issues. Um, and gold is what, six, six or seven tr trillion in total above gold mined, yeah. and it's not all yeah. going to be available for sale. Just how would you talk, talk about the alternative assets and, and maybe a, yeah. a word on Bitcoin crypto realm as well? Yeah, so I, I, I'm fascinated by the whole crypto realm. Um, you know, I, I, I've told this story before, but I kind of have a love-hate relationship with Bitcoin because I started following Bitcoin when it was 25 cents. And at the time, I had just had the... Uh, my son was just uh, like a year old. You know, I had just changed jobs. And I was kind of into, you know, kind of this fluctuation between working for a very big firm and starting my own thing. Tell me and you uh, buying assets on, uh, uh, on the, the, the junk ship, the pirate ship uh, on the weekend. No, 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 no. I wasn't, <laughs> but, but my point, my point is, is I'm usually more than willing to speculate on something like this. And I remember thinking I should just buy five thousand dollars worth and forget about it. But I didn't because I had all these other expenses for, you know, my son and schools and, you know, started my new my new company. Anyway. And so I didn't do it. But I kept on. Of course, you know, that's the, the, the one time in my life I was practical. I, I didn't do it. And, but I think that uh, I think cryptocurrency and, and Bitcoin and Ethereum, these, it's 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 kind of like raw capitalism. Um, and that's what I find fascinating about it. It's just it's buyer beware. You know, huge opportunities, enormous risks. For a long yeah. time, it wasn't even regulated, which I found, you know, it's again, just pure 
pure capitalism. Now it's becoming it's obviously it's become so big and so powerful. When that happens, you know, the regulators are going to take notice and the banks are going to want to get involved anytime the profit's being made. So it's becoming more regulated. Uh, but it's still, compared to most other industries, it's still about as free as it gets. And I think there's enormous, enormous opportunities. I still think that there's enormous risks. I think there's bigger risks than most Bitcoin proponents admit that there are. But it doesn't mean that the opportunity is any less. So I think that if you can afford to have Bitcoin or some other of these digital assets in your portfolio, um, the, the asymmetry involved is it, it almost mandates that you have at least a little bit. And the genie is kind of out of the box on, on these things. And so and the governments have taken notice. And so I do think that there is going to be Fed coin and Euro coin and Yen coin and you know, they're going to get involved in digital assets. Now, whether they let Bitcoin and Ethereum, whether they piggyback on top of those or whether they come up with their own, I would argue they're probably going to come up with their own. Uh, but they've seen how powerful it is, you know, and I think as we move towards MMT and they're going to want to do more, you know, helicopter money for the people, so to speak. What better way to do it than through a digital coin where they can just boom, instantly give it to the individual who has their own number that, you know, they just automatically credit that account. Um, it, 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 I think we're just getting started on this. Um, so I, I, I find the whole, and I don't claim to be an expert on it. I, I'm not, a, I'm not very good with tech. I'm pretty good with economics and I'm pretty good with money, um, but I'm not very good with technology. Um, so a lot of the technology part of it flies over my head. Uh, but, but I think this merger of technology and finance is only going to speed up. Um, and yeah, that's the other thing with the, with this space is, you know, you can do a lot of research and you can get to speed, but if you, if, if, if you go away for two months and come back, everything's changed, you know? Yeah. So it, it's really hard to keep on top of everything, but I just, I think the whole thing's fascinating. I, I actually like to scenario cost the socio-political, the economic, because I'm like you, I'm fascinated by the economics. And I was talking to someone today and uh, I was almost, uh, uh, we call it scenario casting, which is just forward looking possibilities without marrying any of them and remaining mentally open for to adjust. Because I think too many use, too many people use the word believe and they lock on and you yeah. get a lot of Bitcoin maximalists and all of these uh, yeah. elements of things. Uh, and I think the first is really the best. I don't know if they'll ever let you create your own money without killing it or they already have yeah. control over it. So I have a lot of um, a lot of thoughts like that. But when I think about the retail banking, not so much the investment banking, which might be served by DeFi in the future to come. But I think that's still quite raw and developing. Um, I'm wondering if, if we call the whole banking system the lizard. Lizards are famous for sacrificing their tails to yeah. twitch, to distract people. And maybe the they're going to throw us a, a, a bonfire of vanities in the commercial banking. Because I've noticed uh, that a lot of the, in the Americas too, a lot of the branch network is all up for sale, the property units. And it's almost like people are preparing for commercial bank, uh, for retail banking, apologies, for everyday guys branching to largely de cease to exist in, in a physical yeah. manner in the way yeah. we used to. And in some sense, it's a precursor to this digitized money um, yeah. which will be coming and they'll throw us this bone that gets sacrificed you see we kill banking because banking to most yeah. people in the street is their savings Evil. account their checkbook yeah. and their credit card um, yeah. there will still be the requirement for IPOs investment banking and all of that and as I say it will go a bit DeFi but that's still a lot to develop in my view but we'll almost get this twitching tail that is sacrificially uh, sacrificed and said you see in the long run and government will almost um, those jobs will disappear branch yeah. network jobs are pretty poorly paid generally and not particularly interesting but those properties will disappear and maybe it'll become high-rise apartments I actually was involved yeah. in investment apartments that were ex-branch network banks uh, before and uh, that's kind of something that will be uh, sacrificed and say now we've got your new fast money yeah. um, which is cheaper yeah. to move around It'll be the, the it will kill Western Union and uh, the, the likes yep. uh, of those. So you'll see a couple of Kodak industries that emerge and just die um, yep. when they finally let this uh, happen and go. And I'm just wondering, I'm curious what the world looks like then. So we'll have all the space relieved in our high street. That sort of stuff will cease to exist. It's quite fascinating. I just wonder if you have any scenario costs of your own. Um, yeah. In terms well, of how the geopolitical playout will go and, and how men in the street think might see things change. Well, so this is the, I, the, this is why I find this whole area so fascinating, because I think we're going to have 
we're going to have these simultaneous battles going on in the financial landscape. You know, one of the big, I guess, characteristics of cryptocurrency and one of the central tenets of it is the decentralization of it, right? But that's the exact opposite of what governments want. Governments want centralization. Even the most decentralized government wants a lot more centralization than the the least decentralized private, you know, enterprise. Um, so we're going to have this we're going to have this battle between decentralized finance and centralized finance. Um, you know, I and this is why I say the governments will make it much harder for the private market cryptocurrencies than I, than I think many of them admit. Uh, but we're also going to have this battle, I believe, between treasury departments and central banks. Uh, I think most central banks are going to get rolled up into treasury departments and it's going to kind of be one institution rather than two. I think this whole ridiculous theory that central banks are independent is finally going to, you know, get blown away because I, I've, I've never thought that they were independent, no, but that's the, com- that, 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 that's, that's the, that's, that's the common myth that is, you know, perpetuated upon the public is that they're independent and they're looking out for your best interest. Um, so, you know, I, and I, I am not as hopeful. I, I shouldn't say I'm very hopeful that it becomes decentralized. I think that would be the, the best thing and that would become the most profitable and commercially viable thing. But, that's not what governments want. So I, I kind of feel like we could have, to your point, you know, banking could become u- u- a utility and we could have one, the Bank of the United States rather than all these competing banks, right? And the Bank of Europe. And, you know, they would just do everything from the central bank or from the treasury department, you know, digitally, you know, going directly to the people rather than going through all the branch networks. On that point, Jeff, you, you've triggered me on so many interesting concepts there with that discussion, which I didn't mention. The, the, the social uh, cause of universal basic income, tying, yeah. tying in with the trend for me, Lagarde mentioned uh, uh, almost the case under the green banner, the greater green yeah. banner of yeah. perpetual, perpetual quantitative easing which um, when you talk about these concepts of perpetual quantitative easing, don't yeah. forget you're not going to be paying people to sit on their backsides, which is not yeah. non-productive, non-value add. This is, I mean, it's Bolshevism for me by, by no other means. Yeah, it it's is. communistic it is. Bolshevism. But, um, so you're going to have them perpetually releasing fiat, which is obviously a, a, a proliferation. I can't see that private gold ownership can be allowed because it's going to become the only obvious thing um, I feel crypto is already quite owned um, by the people if they allow it to survive. Don't forget on Bitcoin, I, if you move Bitcoin from a wallet address, I can see who you've sent money to. It's an open ledger, ledger for AI bots that work for the revenue to scrutinize anything you bought. Even if you buy some uh, Rizzlers to roll some wacky tobacco on the weekend, they'll know all the detail. They know where you go. Um, and in fact, unless it's a, a really high quality privacy coin, um, everyone will know who you paid what when. So blockchain yeah. and the decentralization, it doesn't mean privacy. They don't no. want you to have privacy. No. The biggest war no. is on your privacy, in my view, in all things, in your privacy. We tracked, we're wearing our prisoner tags with one no. of these uh, yeah. every, where we go, um, and soon they'll, they'll maybe be under our skin. So our privacy and the control and the tagging is such, and blockchain is a great enabler for actually yeah. uh, that tracking. So I'm seeing the combination of paying people to become dependent on state as an entrenchment of state power. It's an extension yeah. of the welfare state that takes us fully into communism after the TB19 has obliterated SMEs world over with as many echo waves as they need to do what they need to do. And when you see that UBI, where's that money coming from? Well, it's not coming from tax revenues. They keep having to raise money. So they're already talking yeah. about environmentalism. You've got a lawyer who's acting as a central banker and he's yeah. talking about solving environmental issues by destroying currency. And I'm thinking, wow, I mean, that's really new. That's almost like your dentist, uh, um, you know, offering to give you an enema at the same time. It's just a different realm uh, <laughs> while you're in the chair. It's, 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 <laughs> it, it truly is. They, they're really broadening their remit and their, their workforce. And I'm kind of thinking, how will that roll into? Is that post our dollar milkshake spike? Are the currencies all going to fail? And this UBI is going to be part of the e-digitized money where they tax you real time. They, they roll, road tax you when you're driving real time and you'll have these minuscule micropayments 
in your car as you bing past infrared tracks yeah. or you've got your 5G phone, everything you do, and you're going to have this real-time money balance is almost altering all the time. You're spending and making money uh, oh. and losing money, and government is probably one of the biggest, uh, probably one of the biggest extractors in that circumstance. If you're still one of the lucky people who can do something productive, how yeah. is that post dollar milkshake? Is that during? So I think I, th I think it, it, I think I think it pro again just pure speculation, right? That, that's kind of part of part. You know, one of the, with the uh, you, I'm because, sure you probably agree with this. Our our job is kind of ridiculous, right? We're trying to predict the future, which you know nobody can predict the future. You can try, and you can get some of it right, but you're not going to get all of it right. But my guess is that some of this stuff is going to be you know kind of dribbled out a little bit. But then when the crisis happens, and whether that crisis is you know, two months or two years from now, I don't know exactly when it's going to be acute, but I, I think, you know, it's probably a couple of years from now. So between now and then, you know, they'll roll out some of these, they'll do these trials. But I think when they have to reset the system, a lot of this stuff will be rolled out at the same time. Yeah, it, it seems like it's queued up to line. And I'm yeah. thinking there's a little bit of an overlap. This is why I'm fascinating for the early signals, because we, we all, you and I will get asked, but when? Okay, yeah. let's say your theory is like everyone wants to know when. It's as if you're giving them the horse that's got to win the Dur you know the Durban July yeah, right. and at what time right. and by how many lengths. They're not yeah. happy that you you're probably giving them a winning horse. Um, they want to know when. Um, and I'm looking at how we can be really fine tuned to see some of the little issues to drop and the preparedness of the real-time yeah. UBI and the digitization of money is the second horse pulling up next to the dying horse. Um, and that's telling you, it's tapping you on the shoulder and saying, you're going to be switching yeah. horses soon. Yeah. And that means yeah. we need our problem reaction into our new solution. Yeah. And um, uh, this is the whole futurism and the scenario casting that I absolutely like. Yeah. And I'll be watching with very fine tuned little, uh, <laughs> what's it, fiberglass t uh, feelers in the, in the web yeah. to see any sign of any of these things coming. Are there any real, real shoes that you say, man, that's a, a we're there, that drops for you. It, it's, that's like, wow, you've got to be in it. It's time. You know, I, I don't know if there's anything real. I mean, I guess if I ever saw, you know, as far as the, the end game, I, I, for, for the U.S. To, to lose its reserve set, I would have to see, you know, a number of other. And, and when I say a number, I don't mean one off bilateral trade agreements between Russia and China. I mean, you know, several countries all at once ha adopting a new system, which is bypassing the U.S. dollar. And they're no longer dependent upon the U.S. for military protection or whatever. And not only the countries, but the banks are involved, like the head of Deutsche Bank and the head of HSBC and the head of J.P. Morgan are, you know, no longer using SWIFT. And they're adopting this new system. You know, if, if I if I ever felt like something like that was actually starting to take place or some of these these individuals started to talk about that, um, yeah. I would I that would be that would be like, OK, ho, ho, here we go. Right. Yeah. Um, but but until that happens. Uh, you know, there's a number of little things that I could name that I, that I watch for. But again, I, I mainly just, uh, you but know, I think, I think that would potentially be drawing the juice away from the dollar milkshake. I'm asking you almost yeah. about the coming of time that it's about to happen and be all that you expect uh, it to be. In other yeah, words, yeah, yeah. what's an affirmatory uh, shoot yeah. to drop rather than a antagonist? Yeah. Well, so, well, I'll, t I'll tell you, the, the, the two biggest positions that we have right now are the Hong Kong dollar peg and the Turkish lira, uh, because we think either one of those will lead to contagion elsewhere. Um, we think those will be two of the first things to happen. We think the Hong Kong dollar peg will break. We think the Turkish lira will lose value. We think Turkey will, uh, the Turkish lira, it, maybe it doesn't go into hyperinflation, but they're going to have a crisis, a funding crisis. And when that happens, we think that kind of kickstarts everything else. Now, whether that happens again next month or if they are they're able to kick it down the road another six months, I don't know. Uh, but I think we're getting pretty close to one of those two things kicking off. So those those are those are my Just two biggest point, markers right now. Come in and give you the chart heads up on that one. We've yet to have the melt up moment that we had uh, at the last crisis. This is the candle yeah. that makes you all the money, really, isn't it? Yeah. And till then, on this up move, we've actually just got moderate size. The blow off yeah. is yet to come. And this is probably going to be an event blow off of far greater scale. In other words, this was the tremor. We are awaiting yeah. the earthquake. And on that yeah. basis, you know, my box doesn't go high enough off the screen. Absolutely. Potentially. Absolutely. 
um, on on a on a melt up trade. So lira and Hong Kong uh, dollar are the beginning yeah. of that's the yeah. warm up event. Lights out, and the curtains about to be pulled for you in terms yeah. of the show starting. The, the, the one thing I would say with regard to to Turkey, I see. I, I think Turkey. I think it's a done deal. It's just a matter of time. The one the yeah. one th the one thing that could take that deal off the table, that done deal off the table, is the fact that they are so strategically important from a geographical perspective, and that if the really push comes to shove, and I think that the U.S. would give them a swap line, but they would have to do it. They would have to get rid of the, the Soviet um, defense systems. So, you know, Erdogan has done a fantastic job of playing both sides, being friends with yeah. the West and being friends with, you know, I, I'm not a fan of yeah. Erdogan, but, I, but, but he is a cool customer and he has mm -hmm. played the game masterfully from, from, from that perspective, uh, being friends with both sides. Uh, I don't think that we would ever give him a swap line as long as he's still doing business with Putin and, and Russia. Uh, but if he were to agree to, you know, no longer use those defense systems in exchange for a U.S. dollar swap line, then that could potentially pull the spiking lira um, thesis off the table. When you uh, that recent period that we both alluded to that was clearly central bank uh, intervention of some sort, my my uh, pink box. Um, yeah. Where did the dollars come from if they weren't indirectly provided, maybe by an intermediary from the? American well, they thing? they got some of them. They got some of them from Qatar. Qatar gave them a swap line. Qatar had dollars, um, and Qatar gave Tur Turkey dollars. And but then the, you know the central bank had dollars in reserves, but they they had to sell them in order to provide them to the. And that's why I say the longer that sideways box happens, the bigger the problem becomes because they're just running out of reserves. Uh, to maintain that stability. And that's why when the stability was gone, you didn't see it slowly go up. It's kind of spikes up, right? Absolutely. Uh, you get your yeah. test, your short pullback, and then you pump. Yeah. Um, my, my view is that America was supportive of them getting the money in the top echelons, because I just don't think they want to see, uh, uh, they don't want the blowback that would go with them allowing yeah. Turkey right. to go large and so I, I, I don't know the U.S. might be more involved in rather trying to put a lid on it than, than maybe we allow for. Because Qatar and some of these Arab states have, are actually got a lot of de facto U.S. military protection sure. and probably yeah. can act be the, the Islamic intermediary to, you know, yeah. we don't want to be known up front as giving you a loan, but we don't want yeah. you to drop it just yet. Here's yeah, some yeah. You know, happy posts. Yeah, the, the, real, the real story is probably always, you know, you, you, the, the conversations that go on behind the curtain with, with this type of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would be fascinating. That's how we could create those, yeah. yeah. Brent, this has been amazing. Thank you very much. I'm very, uh, very much aware of your time, and we've we've been a hog, and we've taken a lot of it. I think I could chat all night to you over a beer yeah, or two, yeah. and I hope to do so someday. Um, for the people that have been part and listening to this, um, Santiago Capital, how do they engage if they'd like to have yeah. you personally them through this incredible reset trading opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Well, so first of all, uh, I want to thank you very much for inviting me because, you know, I loved, I, like you said, I could talk about, we could probably talk for 10 hours and, you know, still, still, still have room more to, to go. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty active on Twitter. So anybody can go on Twitter and look up Santiago Capital. The handle is Santiago AU Fund. Um, you can go to my website, which is just SantiagoCapital.com. And that has my contact information on there. Um, because we run a private fund, we're not allowed to advertise, so it's really just a landing page with uh, with uh, with contact information. But you can send me an email, you can call me, you can send me a direct message on Twitter. I do my best to get back to everybody. I'm not always successful, so you know, feel free to email me again if I don't get back to you initially. Um, but you know, one thing I want to say before we go is, you know, I do a lot of uh, presentations, I do a lot of interviews, I do a lot of podcasts. I don't do them because I want everybody to listen to what I say and just automatically believe what I say. I do it so that I talk about my framework and so that I get people to think, right? And my hope in a lot of this is that somebody's going to hear something I said and then go do some thinking of them uh, for themselves and come back to me with something I haven't heard before, right? Yeah. And so that that's what, it, you know, I really want people to kind of I, the reason I share with what I think and what I learn is so that maybe maybe it spurs others to do the same, and then hopefully I'll get something back from it. Um, and and I, hopefully I've provided a, a a way for people to kind of challenge some of their own assumptions, 
And maybe they don't have to agree with me, but maybe it's made their own arguments stronger because now they've considered the other side. So anyway, that's, I don't know if that helps people think through everything, but that, that's kind of my goal with all this. No, I love the profiling you referred. You have a scientific uh, approach. You put forward a hypothesis and you're prepared to do, uh, have it tested and kicked by others. Um, that's a great uh, aspect uh, and that's proper scientific endeavor. And you have opened a window in many people, both myself and in our community, to the possibility. And even if they're just more awake to the possibility, it may mean they uh, come around a little quicker to thinking, hey, maybe this, uh, that, that, Brent Johnson was on about is going down uh, and I need to uh, pivot uh, while I still can in terms of our position. Yeah. Um, so very, very uh, useful and I think very accurate uh, and very plausible. And uh, I think we're going to be in some of the same trades together. And uh, thank you very much for coming on. Look forward to interacting again on Twitter. And maybe there will be, once there's been some further developments, scope for a Mark II and uh, further discussions on what we touched on today. Brent Johnson, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Look forward to talking to you again. All the best.